Hi, welcome to a special pre-recorded edition of Mary Talk. Um, today we are going to be talking about supporting learners at home. With us today are, there are four faculty members from the College of Education and we are going to talk about some things that are in our research interests and specializations, some tips from the courses we teach. Um, we are also going to answer some of the questions that many of you posed before this session started. Um, my name is Dr. Christy Irish. I am an assistant professor at the University of Mary Washington. My research interests include literacy and working with families, um, families with young children. Today, I'm going to be talking about reading and writing at the different grade levels. I have four children of my own, ages seven to 12. So I am right there with most families. We are going to be answering your questions, but we'll also be just giving some of our tips from when we were teaching. Previously, I was a fourth grade teacher. So hopefully I will be able to help between the ages of preschool up to 12th grade with reading and writing. Melissa? Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Melissa Wells. I am also an assistant professor in the College of Education. Um, my research interests, similar to Christy, I also do some work with literacy and family engagement, also, also culturally responsive pedagogy. Some of my areas that I teach in at the university, in addition to literacy, I am responsible for arts integration for a lot of our elementary students. So that includes an undergraduate course and some master's action research. Um, and as for my prior experience, I also have been in elementary elementary schools. I was a kindergarten teacher, a third grade teacher, and a literacy coach in an elementary setting. So I'm looking forward to supporting you today with some ideas for engaging your students' creativity through the arts and potentially some literacy questions as well. Hi, I'm Christina Peck. I am the Director of Clinical Experiences and Partnerships for the College of Education. I have had the opportunity to teach our introductory class and uh, instructional technology courses. I was a high school mathematics teacher for nine years in Spotsylvania County. I was able to teach everything from Algebra 1 to AP Calculus while I was there. So I have a lot of background on the secondary level, but I'm also getting my first experience at the primary level because I have a kindergartner this year. I also have a preschooler and I have a 14 week old baby. So I definitely understand the balance of trying to work and having three young ones all under the age of seven in the house at the same time. And I am Dr. Jennifer Walker. I'm an assistant professor in the College of Education. I have been teaching special education in some capacity for over 20 years. I have K through 12 experience as a special education teacher. And now I teach courses in special education as well as our classroom management. That's also where my research interests lie around classroom and behavior management as well as positive behavior supports. I have three children who are 8, 11, and 14. So we are in elementary school, middle school, and on the cusp of high school. All right, so I think we're going to go back to our informational portions of our slideshow. So Christy, take it away. Okay, today I'm going to be talking about literacy at home um, and just a few tips that hopefully will help you and maybe some goals for you to set for yourself. Um, first of all, when we talk about reading and writing, when we are talking about a preschooler all the way up through 12th grade and adulthood, our main goal should always be that reading and writing are enjoyable. We want students to develop a love of reading and writing as they're learning. If we can get that goal, then the rest will easily follow. Um, preschool through second grade, when we think about what literacy experiences they should be having, um, and I'm gearing this towards if you are looking for ways to help your student at home, if you haven't been given instruction on what you should be doing with your child. In general, we wanna think about the time that we spend reading, whether it's five minutes or 20 minutes, 
that they be developing a love of reading. And a lot of that is going to come with support from you and the interactions that you have with them. We would like students to read a blend of fiction and nonfiction, so different types of texts. Um, and I did want to discuss today just some of the questions that you could ask with young students to help them with their comprehension of the text and making it more enjoyable. One strategy we can use is called dialogic reading. Um, it is an acronym of CROWD and there are different questions that while we're reading a book or a student's reading a book that we can discuss with them. Um, the first is completion prompts. So if you are reading a story or doing a nursery rhyme such as hickory dickory dock the mouse ran up the if i leave a blank then the student can complete it they ran up the clock um, the second type of prompt is a recall prompt this is where after a student has read or we are reading to our child we can just ask them to recall what happened to tell us about what they remember the third are open-ended questions. So finding something in the text that was interesting and asking a type of question to it. Um, if you could build a house, what kind of house would you build? Or something like that. Um, WH questions, those are pretty self-explanatory. Going through um, who, what, when, why, where, and how, and asking students or children to complete those questions based on the reading that you've done. Um, the fifth is a distancing question prompt. It, these questions are where students can make connections to the outside world. It's important that we make the text relevant to them, so we ask them what this reminds me of. For example, if I was reading the three little pigs and it's talking about the different types of houses i might ask the child what is our house made out of and so we could have those discussions that help distance um, bring the text closer to their real lives many parents at this early age are also thinking about how they can help their young child begin to read Two ways that we can do that for preschoolers through second grade are making sure that they are working with their alphabet. This could be identifying letters that they see in their environment. They can make and write letters. And when I say make letters, it doesn't always have to be with a crayon or a pencil or something like that. We also want to use manipulatives around the house. So thinking about having them make letters out of Play-Doh or pipe cleaners, popsicle sticks, really anything that you have that can make it fun is going to be the most beneficial for children. Um, phonological awareness is another skill that is worked on a lot um, in these early grades, and that is being able to hear different sounds when students are reading. It's kind of one of the foundations of literacy and reading, um, that they can hear those sounds. We can do that through students playing rhyming games, reading poetry, nursery rhymes, songs, and then also manipulating different words and playing with words. So if I um, had a child tell me what sounds were in cat, like k, a, t, and then to manipulate it, I might ask them if it started with an mm sound, instead what would the word become? And they might say mat. Writing preschool through second grade, there is a wide variety of activities that we can do. They don't all have to be formal writing. The idea is just to increase the amount of writing that they're doing. So they could be making books with blank pages, writing cards or letters to family members, um, making up their own recipes or writing down a recipe as you cook dinner. They can provide direct, written directions for something. My children especially love making directions on how to play a game that they have created themselves. Um, they write signs around the house. It could be rules for their room or different rules of the house. Usually that's when that occurs. Um, we also need to consider things that drawing, painting, pictures are all acceptable forms of writing at this stage. Third through sixth grade reading, our goal here is to continue their love of reading, but we also need to keep in mind, especially while we're at home, that reading is a skill that takes stamina that we need to build. So my suggestion would not be to have your child start reading 30 minutes every day 
until the end of school. Remember that they need to build up this stamina. So the first week, I might just start with having them read to me five minutes, or I read to them five minutes and then they read to me. And then each week, I could increase that time by a couple minutes until they've worked up to 30 minutes or so. They should be also reading a wide variety of genres and formats. So it could be a novel, it could be a comic book, graphic novels, newspapers, anything that they can read is going to count in this. Um, at this stage, vocabulary and comprehension are skills that they are working on. In order to have those skills, they have to be able to build background knowledge around what they are reading. Um, one of my favorite ways to do this is through virtual field trips. I'm sure you've seen a lot posted online about these, but I did want to share Google Expeditions with you. Um, and up in this graphic, if you search for the app, that is what comes up. But they have virtual field trips of many places around the United States and around the world. There's a few thousand. You do not have to have a virtual reality device to use these. You can just do them on a phone or an iPad also. Um, and there's reading involved. They give prompts for students. They tell them about it or students can just walk around that place and explore. Um, another way to build background knowledge is just by having discussions with friends or family on certain topics. Really at this time, one thing they will miss is that interaction and learning with other people. So you being involved or them talking with a friend about a subject is a great way to keep them connected. Writing at this stage continues with cards, letters, poems. Journaling is a great activity at this time that can also help with some of their emotional needs. They could make their own comics, books, recipes, and then I also, at this age, write it in, or added in word games, playing Scrabble or Bananagrams or something like Apples to Apples, which would also work on vocabulary and comprehension, would be great fun ways to help students stay motivated at this age. Sixth through 12th grade, we want to continue with reading and writing, building stamina and wide reading. I think this is also a great opportunity when they may have your support or not as much as the younger ones, but while you're with them, to help them evaluate some of the sources for their reading and writing, looking at websites together and discussing whether it's a reliable source, what is going on in the world, and really asking them questions that prompt critical thinking. So what are they thinking about everything that is going on? Or some, if they read something, on climate change. What do they think about that? Um, and making yourself available just to have those conversations. Not that you're having to teach them that content, but that they get a chance to go through it with somebody and process that information. When in their writing at this stage, um, they can still write letters and cards and all of those. Usually these students have some connection still with their peers. When we think about their academic writing, still continuing to help them think about the main ideas of what they just read and helping them synthesize those main ideas would be great. Um, journaling, comics, poetry would still be appropriate at this age. I know that it's not a completely comprehensive list of all the literacy activities, but I'm hoping that will help get you started at least one stage. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa Wells now. Awesome. Thank you for all those great ideas, Christy. So I'm going to pick up where Christy left off a little bit with fostering creativity through the arts. And literacy is one of the art forms that we'll talk about during this as well. Um, so a little bit more about my background. I actually, as an undergraduate myself, I did both a music major and I did education. Um, I believe strongly in using the arts in my classroom. In my first six years of teaching, I was actually in an arts integrative school in South Carolina, which was a fantastic fantastic experience to see how the arts can directly impact our children's learning in the classroom and beyond. So a couple of benefits of the arts. Um, the first is that they are serious and rigorous academic subjects. Sometimes we forget and think that they're just a little bit fluffy, things like that. You hear a lot of budget cuts, cuts related to the arts and things like that, but they are serious and rigorous academic subjects. We actually do have standards in the state of Virginia for many of these art areas that they need to start learning as early as kindergarten. They're also an essential way to express human knowing. 
So we need to remember that we don't just write, we don't just read, we also create, we paint, we sculpt, we dance, we use music to express as well. Another piece of research that is pretty common is that reading, writing, and math skills, among other academic skills, can be enhanced through the arts. We want to make sure we're enjoying the arts in and of themselves, but there are some academic benefits that we can reap by using these. There's a lot of connections you can make between different content areas and the arts that you're doing in your homes. The third is that, of course, creativity is naturally developed through the arts. And we're seeing that more and more employers are wanting students who can think critically and creatively instead of just providing the same correct answer. Instead, they're looking for innovative solutions to problems. The arts are a great way to practice that skill from a very young age. The student engagement and persistence do improve with an arts-based curriculum. So I know sometimes we're seeing a lot right now with students who are shutting down and really having a hard time staying engaged in the work that they're doing. The arts make that experience more joyful. And we see a lot of the times that students, their engagement does pick back up when we introduce an art form as a means of expressing content. And finally, understanding oneself and others, also known as empathy, expands with arts education. There are academic benefits to arts integration, but there are also social and emotional important things that students can learn from these as well. So the benefits are wide ranging and I think you can see why it's important to use these with our students. Two theories that we talk a lot about in education that are related to this idea of arts integration. Constructivism is a theory that says that we believe learning is actively built. So instead of me just telling you about something, instead of me telling you that this is the most effective way to build a bridge, I'm going to ask you to go build a model bridge and see what happens. Related to that, it's, it's experiential. I'm building off of the experiences that my children have had. I'm building off of what they're seeing as they're trying things out in person, which then and leads to the reflective component. I'm reflecting on what's working, what's not working, and then I'm evolving. I'm changing my understanding of the content. There's also two other important elements that it is collaborative and problem solving. So I know right now, since we are in social distancing procedures, sometimes collaboration can look a little bit different, but odds are good that you have at least one other person in the household with you. Um, collaboration can occur in the family. It can also occur in virtual spaces. So we can be problem solving together via Zoom or other video platforms, things like that. And again, problem solving. So is there a way that I can make sure that I'm contextualizing the skill in an actual legitimate problem like a bridge construction, something like that? So the idea of constructivism. This is that I'm not just pouring knowledge into students, but that I'm actively engaging them in the construction of their own understanding. This does yield a lot more student engagement and lasting understanding of the content. And another one we talk about a lot in education is Bloom's taxonomy. So this taxonomy looks at the different levels of thinking skills that we ask students to do in different types of contexts. At the base of the pyramid is your basic remembering skills. So being able to repeat back a definition or memorize a year of a certain event in history, something like that. You see we're moving up the pyramid to the top, create. And of course, the arts have many, many opportunities for creation, producing, designing new original work. So in all the different art forms, we do have opportunities for creation. So a couple of ideas of what you could try at home. These are not exhaustive lists by any stretch of the imagination. And I wanted to emphasize that you don't need to go get special materials. Use what you have at home, be creative with them. So I do discuss five different arts areas with my um, Mary Washington students. And so I've tried to give you an idea for each of these different art areas, but feel free to Google other art ideas, things like that. Um, but my main challenge to you is to create invitations and challenges that are more open-ended. So I know we all have relied on coloring books as a way of survival at one point or another, even as adults to de-stress, the adult coloring book movement um, has raised in popularity the past few years. However, those are a little bit more passive activities that don't get higher into those Bloom's taxonomy levels where I'm not asking the student to actually create. So the examples I've given you here today are to help you think through more of that original creation aspect. 
And literary art, echoing what Christy has already said, bookmaking is a fantastic way to dig into that. All you have to do is just staple some paper together and let the students go at it. So if you're working with a young child, maybe stapling two pieces of paper folded in a booklet together. If you're working with an older student, you might even want a hole punch, something like that, um, to make it a longer book for them. I also really enjoy working with poetry. Um, one model of poetry that I use a lot is called blackout poetry. It's a form of appropriation art where I'm taking other people's writings, be that a book that is falling apart and I'm using pages from, a news article that's in the newspaper or maybe something I've read online that I'm either downloading as an image that I'm manipulating on a device or I've printed out. And with blackout poetry, I'm going to pick out certain words that I really think are powerful and I'm going to black out the other words. So then from this original text, I now have a new piece of poetry that's my own. So that again is called blackout poetry. For visual arts, uh, one idea is to just find random materials in your house and ask students what they can create. So again, leaving that as an open-ended idea. You can do this with recycled materials. You can do this with nature materials. Go on a nature walk, collect some things. Um, so that's one idea of creation that you can do with visual art, just whatever you have at home. Of course, if you have paints, anything like that, those are great materials. Puppetry is also a part of visual art, which we'll get into drama as well in just a second second here. You could ask students to create puppets from old socks that have holes in them or brown paper bags, all kinds of things with that. The third art form, drama. So one way you could do this is to challenge your child to write a play. Ask them to include props and scenery, which again goes back to some of the visual arts. You can see how this gets to be all encompassing. You could ask them to write a play about some content that they're even learning in school. So if they're studying ancient Greece or something like that, they have to write a play that speaks to some of the content that they were learning in school or maybe goes one step beyond it. Or imagine that they were moved to present day, what would it be like for them? So those are some ideas for drama. Also lots of improv games you can play with your children at home so that helps them kind of think on their feet and that is a form of drama as well, the improv. Dance and movements. You can choreograph a dance, you can perform it to music or just on your own. Um, young children especially have a natural love of movement. So use that to get some wiggles out. And of course, we can use this as a more structured or less structured, depending if you want it to just be free movement or if you want it to be actual choreographed to eight counts, things like that. And then finally, music. Um, there are tons of opportunities there. One could be to create your own instrument, again, using materials you have at home. You could create an electronic composition using something like GarageBand. You have a lot of options that you can do there. One other thing I wanted to highlight is, I know me personally, I am turning to some forms of art, so I'm picking back up some piano. I haven't done much since college because I need a break from screens right now. So what's a really nice benefit of some of these art forms is that they do take us away from our devices and get us in a more creative mood. So just keeping that in mind is a benefit as well. Some other ideas, there are several forms of art that you can enjoy together through things like virtual museums and streamed performances. There are plenty of articles online linking you to some of those kinds of things, so feel free to Google some of those, but you could enjoy those together as a family or just ask the child to do that themselves. Make it as structured or unstructured as your child needs. So you might be reading some of these ideas and thinking, my child wouldn't know where to start with this. First of all, I would encourage you that sometimes when we open that door, kids surprise us. Their creative abilities can be amazing, and sometimes they'll come up with things we never thought of. But if your child needs a little bit more structure, feel free to give them some parameters for here are two items, what could you create with this kind of thing. We wanna make sure we're giving students lots of choice, um, but we also wanna make sure that we're not overwhelming them with too many choices or a complete lack of choice. And like we were just saying, be prepared to be amazed at your child's creative abilities. That was one of my favorite things, working with students across from kindergarten up through college. Again, they've created things that I never could have dreamed of, and I really do appreciate seeing how creativity expresses itself in a lot of different areas. So I'm going to send this back over to Christina. All right, thank you, Melissa. Um, I wanted to talk to you about not always having to stick to the curriculum you're given. There are learning opportunities all over the place. And I know one of our biggest concerns is that we're not getting exactly what is in the kindergarten curriculum or exactly what's in algebra. I want you guys to know that it's bigger than that. Um, excuse me. 
So I'm going to go ahead and sh share my screen. Let me make sure I can do this right. But I want to expose you guys to something called the Virginia Five C's. This is now part of the portrait of a Virginia graduate. So the Virginia Department of Education has said that it's not just about the curriculum anymore. We want to help our students be prepared to be successful when they graduate and they leave the public school system. So the five C's are critical thinking skills, collaboration skills, communication skills, creative thinking skills, and citizenship skills. And Dr. Irish and Dr. Wells both mentioned those throughout their suggestions. But I wanted you guys to be aware of exactly what the portrait of a Virginia graduate says. We want our students to be able to achieve and apply academic and technical knowledge. So we need to be able to apply this knowledge in the real world. We need to be able to demonstrate workplace skills, qualities, and behaviors. Those are things that your child can practice at home just with their siblings and with their parents. Build connections and value interactions with others as responsible and responsive citizens. And then align knowledge and knowledge skills and personal interest with interest with career opportunities. We want our students to find passion. We want them to find something that makes them excited, that makes them want to learn. And that's what I'm going to discuss a little bit today. One thing I do, as I mentioned in my introduction, I have a kindergartner, I have a preschooler, and I have a baby. So I am trying to think a little bit outside the box with my kindergartner and especially my preschooler because I need to find things where I can engage both of them. So something I've discovered that's been really successful is giving them a challenge. Um, right now, one of our favorite TV shows is Lego Masters and it has captured my kids far beyond anything I can imagine. They get so excited to see what these people are going to create every week. So what we started doing is creating our own version of it at home. I just use whatever Legos we have. It happens to be Duplos that they're really into right now. Um, but I, they ask me for a challenge each day and I give them one. I tell them, go build me a boat or go build me, we did a baseball um, stadium. The, one of the local uh, businesses in the area, the Fredericksburg Area Building Association actually put out a challenge recently for students to build um, houses. So that was a really big exciting experience for um, my student, my children. So I have a picture of that on there just in case you guys wanted to see it. But what you're basically doing is something called a design brief. And design briefs are something that are used in elementary schools very much to help with STEM education. But these are the basic parts of a design brief and they can really be connected to all sorts of things. So the first thing you start with is some kind of background. What knowledge will your students draw from? Now, the neat thing about this is it doesn't have to just be Legos. It could be, oh, we read this book last night. Um, we read a book about a gingerbread man who needs to cross over a river. So they have something that they've engaged with before and they're gonna draw knowledge from that story. Then you give them a challenge. Say we're going with the book, with the gingerbread man. He needs to be able to cross the river. How is he gonna cross the river? That's the challenge to the kids. How, are they, how will he be able to do this? So you give them a challenge of something that you want them to do. Then give them a criteria. It could be time limit. It could be certain items that they have to use. But what are those specifications? That's also really good for the real world because oftentimes we work under specifications or limits that we have to be able to apply. And then the last thing is materials. No one expects you to go out and buy all of these supplies to keep your kids entertained. What do you have around the house? The Legos, we had them around the house, so we started using them. Another day, we used marshmallows and toothpicks that happened to be around the house, and they built stuff with those. So maybe those are your materials. But give them a time to be creative and problem solve. The other uh, picture on the screen, uh, the one on the bottom, is a recycle, well, actually, it's a trash truck, if you ask my kids. It was made out of recycled materials because they happened to be doing recycling in kindergarten. That was the topic that was given to us this past week. So for recycling, we started talking about what different materials can be recycled. And then I literally had my kids go through the recycling bin and we made a truck. And they were talking about the different parts of the truck and why could this be recycled versus this couldn't. And it led to a re really great discussion and it was a family activity that we were all able to do together. And they are really proud of what they made. So it's really nice to give them a challenge and let them go with it. It ties into what Dr. Wells was talking about with the creation part and really hitting that higher level blooms. 
Now, in the secondary world, um, you often hear something called project-based learning. So project-based learning is a teaching method, and this is a definition from the Buck Institute for Education. They do have a whole website dedicated to this. It's a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex problem or challenge. You give them a problem, and there's not necessarily one answer, and they have to do the work. So what this looks like in a classroom is the teacher designs learning experience, but the students take control and they drive the experience. They figure out what do they need to know. How can they figure out what they need to know? And the teachers that are facilitate, that's a perfect role for a parent, is to be a facilitator for this knowledge. So if on the secondary level, this is a great way to make students critically think, problem solve, communicate, and even potentially collaborate, whether it's within your family or they work with another, uh, one of their friends. So some thoughts here are maybe you make them do a project or there's a project that they're really interested in. Are they interested in gardening? If they're into gardening or being outside, maybe the, the question is you're in charge or the problem is you're in charge of building our vegetable garden this year. What do you need? And they have to design a proposal. They have to figure out how much wood do they need to make the, the sides of the bed? How much uh, soil do they need to fill it? That's all math right there. That's perimeter, that's area, that's volume. And these are, this is a practical way to apply that knowledge. Um, then they can work on budgeting. You can give them $30 and say, you have to do all of this for this much money. How are you going to do it? And they take it and they go with it. And they could have to present it to you at the end. Um, maybe you let them do it and they get to work hands-on learning tools um, and stuff like that. Another idea is your, your student wants something. They're really trying to you know, say, I need that new iPhone or I need this, I need that. Have them write a proposal. Have them do the research, have them be able to justify their needs and versus a want and have them present it to you. That way they really have to go into more than just, I want this. Okay, well, why? Tell me, give me a real explanation. Yes, this is not in the curriculum. It's not standard two of, you know, the English, uh, English six standards, but they're communicating. They're having to justify, they're having to be able to articulate exactly what they want and in a way that persuades people. So you're really hitting a lot of things. And lastly, as I said at the beginning, learning's everywhere. And also don't be afraid of questions. I know our kids sometimes can have so many questions and at some points we're just like, okay, stop. <laughs> but go with those questions. If they wanna know how something works, look it up with them. You know, really foster that creativity, really foster their desire to know things and be inquisitive. So, you know, there's some ideas in cooking, have them cook with you, ask them what would happen if you have to double the recipe or if you had to take half of the recipe. That's working on math as well. Reading, uh, I'm currently reading a book, uh, Percy Jackson with my kindergartner and it's about Greek mythology. And he has so many questions now. So we're talking about that and we're researching that. Take a walk. You never know what you might see. That's a lot of science uh, opportunities right there. And games, there's a picture of my son. I did block out his face. I didn't get his permission to share it. Um, that's us playing Catan Jr. And it's a strategy game. And the, how fast he picked up this game, I wouldn't have expected. But the he, I will admit he's beaten me a couple of times, um, but he's so good at the problem solving and the thinking ahead and justifying what he has to do that it's really been fun watching him evolve through games. Um, but I want you guys not to be afraid to step away from exactly what your teacher sends you that day. It is okay to let your student drive what they want to learn because they're still going to be learning. And I'm going to now turn it over to um, Dr. Walker. I need to stop sharing, don't I? Ooh, there we go. All right, and then I am going to actually share. So I will be showing you some ideas um, and showing you what you can do with all these awesome ideas that you've been getting from Christy and Melissa and Christina. And as Christina just mentioned, you're probably getting some things from school. Um, some people are getting choice boards, others are getting lists of links, or perhaps you're not getting a lot from school or from the school division and you're trying to figure out what to do. So using all these ideas, 
I want to show you some ways to develop schedules for your children. Um, I'm going to show you three different ones. One is elementary, one's middle, one's almost high school, and then a more simplistic version. We do these sometimes in our house during the summer just to kind of keep us organized. Um, but what I have done for my own children, and this is also something that I used to do when I would work with teachers who had um, students who had some behavioral needs, is that we would come up with a schedule that was predictable and consistent, and that's really helpful. So what you're looking at here is an elementary example, and what's different about this than the others that I'll show you is that this has a lot of outside play built in. Um, knowing that my son really does need that activity and it's very difficult for him to focus, especially to work independently, it was really important that we build in that time for him to be able to go and just kind of get the wiggles out. I am working at home, so he does need to be independent. So what I have tried to do is to think about where he can do that outside play when he's outside and I can see him out the window. That's when I do the hard stuff for work. Um, so this particular schedule builds in a number of academics. So things like his morning work, which his teacher provided. Um, journal writing was something that I created and I also had him, um, also he could write a friend. Um, so that was another option for him. I've given him some journal ideas that I just Googled and found online. And then every week down at the bottom, you can see that I give him a list of people he could possibly write. Sometimes those lists stay the same because he chooses to do the journal every day. Other times I know that um, he's missing a friend, so I might put their name down there for him to connect with a friend that he has been missing in school. So that's something that I do include for him as well are some of these choices at the bottom when he gets stuck. The way that I have his schedule designed is that the outside play is actually a reinforcement, which is why it's in red. So in order to get that outside play, he first has to do his morning work and his journal writing. So once he gets those two things completed, he can have his outside play. When he comes back inside, he has to do two more activities and then again can go outside. When we first started this, he did move across the schedule. So he would do morning work, journal, play, reading comprehension, math. We're at the point now where we've kind of gotten this under our belt and he is moving around a little bit more. So there are some days when he jumps straight to read for 20 minutes and does his chores and then goes outside and then we'll come back to the morning work and journal. But that's after some time of actually getting to know the schedule and using it. And we had a lot of trial and error to get that to work. Um, you'll also see at the bottom, even with outside play, I do give him choices because I do really need that time for him to be outside for me to get my work done. So I try to give him a number of things he can think about before he even goes out there. So this is an elementary example with some reinforcement built in. So let me show you, um, this is an upper elementary um, schedule. You can see it's, there's a lot less on the schedule and you don't see that there is any reinforcement built in. Um, for my daughter and for some students, for some children, they can self-monitor throughout the day. I will tell you that another thing that you can do is you can actually assign times to each of these activities. So that at nine o'clock you do this, at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, and depend depending on how your student needs those structured activities during the day, depending on how much support they need, or depending on how much they need to know exactly what's happening when, adding that time can be really helpful for both your child and for you. It's helpful for them because it creates that predictability. They don't have to make a choice about what they're doing next. They know it's nine o'clock, I'm gonna do my genius time. Now it's nine. And what this does for you is you can also assign times so that at 10 o'clock, if you know that you need have a meeting, then you can do your student's silent reading time or your child's silent reading time. So that gives you some flexibility as well with your day. Let me show you the high school example or the middle school example. So you can see on this particular schedule, it's a little bit different. You see all these blocks where everything's kind of um, deleted almost. And that's because we decided to do one primary subject a day. Um, for the organizational piece of having different teachers and different types of submitting work and different links, it just made more sense for us to focus on just math 
on Thursdays, just science on Tuesdays. And what this does is it allows her to pull up all the material that one teacher provides to her and go through it from top to bottom because toggling between all of her different courses can be very stressful because there's a lot going on. So we're just sticking with one subject a day. I did ask my daughter which of these she would like to do first, you know, up front in the week and towards the end of the week. And we made the decision in our household that she was going to do her agricultural science work on Monday because Monday tends to be a heavier work day for me. So I knew that Monday morning, I was going to be going through emails from the weekend and getting caught up on things. And I wanted something for her that I knew she could do on her own. And that agricultural science, I knew she could do on her own. So we decided to start the week with that. And then we ended the week with geography because it's a subject that she really enjoys and she enjoys the teacher. So she thought she wanted to go into the weekend on that high note. So that was completely kind of a um, collaboration between she and I on getting that done. And you'll also see at the bottom of her schedule that I've included the different days of the week and when she has required meetings. Um, so on Monday, she does, still does her Girl Scout. So I've even included that on her schedule. So it's a regular routine for her. And the other thing that we've done actually since we created this initially is we actually even assign the device that she'll be using. Um, we have some devices that are better than others with different platforms. So we have one device that the camera won't work for Google Meet. Um, we have another device that it doesn't seem like it can connect to some of the Blackboard features. So we've gotten so specific as to actually not only just where the meeting can be found and what the password is, but what device you should be using in order to engage with that meeting. And that has been really helpful because this is the sheet that she uses all week and we just kind of add to it as we go along. The last thing I'll share is something much more simplistic. Um, if you don't want that very complicated schedule, you don't have time to do that right now, you can just think about a checklist. Um, Oftentimes screens are motivating for students. They wanna get on that iPad or they wanna get on the gaming system. So figure out what reinforcer is going to work for your individual child. It's gonna be different for every, every individual. So um, my youngest, he works for going outside. Um, my middle child works for that screen time. My oldest works for the opportunity to be able to watch TV. So in order to do that, you can also just create a really simple checklist. Did you finish your math? Have you done your chores? Did you write in your journal? So anything that you want to list. And just like Christina mentioned, you don't have to just stick to what the school has provided to you. If you know that your, your child is struggles in math or really does need to read more often or you know, needs a prompt to be able to go outside and play because otherwise they will just stay inside, then include those things on your schedule for your child because then it gives them that checkpoint to be able to say yeah i've done this today so be flexible and i really encourage you to talk with your child about how they want it to look because we've actually tried a number of iterations and we started at one point with times and within the first day everybody said no we don't like the times we like to be able to have that flexibility and for my kids that works but it may not work in your house so just be flexible and have those conversations at this point, I think we're going to join back together and go through some of the questions that we were provided from the alumni. We thank you for providing questions so we know exactly what it is that you want us to discuss. That was very helpful. Um, we've kind of broken them down into three areas that you really discussed engagement, organization, and then dealing with some of the social emotional issues. Um, I want to start, Melissa, with the first question, which says, I'm struggling to be able to teach concepts rather than just support my child. My kids don't want to do boring handouts, but I have no clue on how to help them progress. What suggestions can you give? That is a great question, and I know that's impacting a lot of people right now. So first, I wanted to back up just a little bit about 
I know that the struggle to want to teach concepts and perhaps feeling like the school isn't providing you some support there. The reason why is many schools have decided that teachers are not allowed to introduce new content right now because of equity, issues of equity and access. So not all students might have reliable internet access, might not have families who have the time and support to work with children at home and on this new content. For example, if I am an essential employee or if I am a healthcare worker, I might be working very long shifts and not be able to work with my child. Um, so that's one reason why the schools are not sending home new learning opportunities. It's to make sure that everyone kind of has an equal footing when we start again. Um, in the meanwhile, I would say keep challenging your child to think through some of the things that we've presented today. Um, so is there a way that you can use a design challenge like Christina was talking about? Are there some ways that you can give them some literacy activities like Christy was talking about? The standards of learning for the state of Virginia are accessible on the VDOE webpage. If you're curious what else your child in their grade needs to know, they're sorted out by grade level. But the bottom line is that all of the teachers are going to be working very hard at the beginning of the year next year to get your child caught up. So please don't worry about them falling behind. Do stuff together as a family right now. Allow them to go outside, play, enjoy their time. They are learning through all of those kinds of situations and that's a really important thing to keep in mind. So yes, maybe stray away from those handouts if you can by giving them some real life applic applic application, there we go, of some of those skills. Um, but yes, just know that we will the teachers will be working with your children when they come back in next year. We have another parent that has a kindergartner and her question says her kindergartner is entering in the fall. She wants to make sure she knows what she should teach her so she is successful in kindergarten. Um, preschools are closed in addition to elementary, middle school, high school, all schools being closed. So what do parents need to do um, to help them succeed and be ready to start school in the fall, hopefully. Um, my advice would be the things that you most likely are already doing, continuing to read to your child, um, getting them involved in what interests them. So finding things to do around the house, but really just involving them and keeping lines of communication with them open, talking to them, having discussions, reading to them. Um, if you really are ready to get started, you can start thinking about some of those alphabetic principles that I talked about in the beginning, playing with rhymes and playing with words is going to be one of the easiest ways to start. Um, moving up, Christina, we have a question for sixth and seventh graders. Um, how can we encourage sixth and seventh graders with their critical thinking and problem solving? I know you discussed this a little bit. Yes, um, again, one of the best ways is to get them to create to get them engaged in something that is very authentic and something that means a lot to them. That way they're going to want to dig into it more. And then there's gonna be lots of opportunities for discussion. Um, as Christy mentioned earlier, if they wanna research something online, even just thinking about, is this a, a reliable site? Is this um, you know, something that is biased one way or another? Um, those are all really good critical thinking skills that are not only going to help them now when they're trying to learn about something, but it's going to help them later down the road. And, um, and not a lot of people are aware of this, but there are computer science standards that are listed from K through 12 now in the state of Virginia. And being able to tell if something's reliable or not, it is part of those computer sta uh, science standards. So you are really helping them um, develop some critical skills there. So let them kind of drive that so they get interested and then you're gonna have some great discussions which will naturally really foster those five C's. Um, more middle school questions for fourth through sixth graders. What might be some great writing prompts that you could give Melissa? Yeah, so writing has actually come up in several of our discussions today, so that was great to see. Um, I think the first thing to start with is your students' interests. So are there questions that they're asking? Are there passions that they want to bring to the table? 
instead of just issuing a blanket writing prompts, um, we'll see students reply to those, but often with kind of surface level details and things like that. So I'm trying to make it as authentic as possible. I was speaking with someone recently who's working with um, a student on making a field guide, looking at different animals in their backyards. Um, also, another technique that I like to use in upper elementary is doing something like a heart map. This comes from Georgia Heard. Her idea basically is that you draw a heart on a piece of paper and then you write things inside the heart that are important to you. Maybe these are people, places, experiences, or events. And this becomes a brainstorming map for you about, okay, I have all these ideas on this piece of paper. What am I going to write about today? So that you're not just starting spinning the wheel every single time you're sitting down to write. Um, again, like Christy said, offering a variety of genres to work with so that I'm not just all the time doing the same type of writing. Maybe I'm doing it in different spaces. Um, how am I going to have an authentic audience? Um, who can I share this writing with? Um, how can I make sure that I'm maybe trying something virtually as well. So maybe I'm, I know that Jen was working with her own children on their teach, their Girl Scout um, troop leader, showed them how to create like an animated story in um, Google Slides and things like that. And Jen, I noticed you had talked about journal prompts. Do you wanna share any of those that you do with your own kids? Um, I actually, we, I just pulled a list that I had found online, but I do tell them that when they read the prompts, if there's something that they want to add or change, I give them that freedom to be able to do that because then it does make it more meaningful. Um, I don't have them stick to the prompts exactly. And I do give them a pretty extensive list so that they have the opportunity to pick and choose. I never just assign a prompt. Um, I want them to be able to have that flexibility because I find that they're more engaged if they are able to do that. We have another writing question. Um, this parent has a first grader that when they discuss writing comes up with a lot of great ideas, but then when it actually comes to the writing it down part, the student is pretty frustrated and gets distracted easily. Do you have any tips for helping that student? Yeah, so especially with younger writers, writing can be a frustrating point. And we sometimes see this around kindergarten, first grade, when they have ideas that are bigger than what their independent capabilities are to get them down on paper. Sometimes I've seen a lot in my own kindergarten classroom, um, that's where they would sometimes shut down and just not know how to tackle the task. So I think there are a couple different issues here. First of all, emotions. This is a big situation for little people to process. So even the slightest challenge might be harder for the student to persevere in light of. So I think validating with the children that this is an unusual time and they're going through a lot and talking about those feelings and maybe even getting them to journal to, to write some stories or even draw some pictures that is an authentic form of literacy and writing as well. So to that end, maybe trying some different types of genres. So back to the Google Slides, maybe I'm importing some images and I'm narrating my slide. I'm stepping away from that written version of print. So you're mentioning a first grader sometimes for First graders are still developing that. So can I narrate my story? Can I write a wordless picture book? Um, another strategy I liked using when I was a kindergarten teacher is called a have a go paper. So I would have three columns on the paper and the first column was the student's attempt at the word because sometimes they would get stuck and not know how to go beyond the word. And so they would write the word, what they thought it was on my chart and then I would come back to them later. So if you're doing other things at home, you could come back and help them with several words at one time. The middle column, I would put the dictionary spelling for them. And I'm very careful to use the term dictionary spelling because the right wrong dichotomy also doesn't help when our young writers are figuring out that there is a right way to spell things. You're kind of reinforcing that and sometimes that makes them a little more afraid to try. So I'd put the dictionary spelling in the middle column and then in the last column, I would ask the child to practice the dictionary spelling which they could then translate back to their writing. So if the struggle is spelling and things like that, I found the Have a Go paper to be a really helpful tool. I think that's a great idea. We also have to think about what the purpose of that writing is. If it's to get their ideas down, then there's nothing that says that I can't help transcribe for them. Maybe she could tell me, or you could have her tell you her story and you write it down um, and then have the child read it back and see if they want to edit anything. Um, and that's a great way to get ideas out there. If the purpose is writing, part of that is getting ideas on paper, not necessarily their best handwriting and putting that down. Um, we have 
Another organization question. We had several organization questions. I think Dr. Walker has done a great job, hopefully answering some of those. But this one is about a teenage boy with ADHD doing online coursework um, across multiple means of communication. Um, do you have any tips to help that child stay motivated instead of getting frustrated? Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that you can do as a parent, first of all, is wherever that child is working, if you could find a place that's free of distraction just to begin with. Um, if they're working in their bedroom, um, that may not be the best place. If they also have you know, a gaming system that's waiting for them in the corner, or if they're very much into Legos and they still like to build and if there's some waiting for them off to the side. So finding a place in the house that's free of distractions is helpful in the moment. But when it comes to actually dealing with all the different components of learning, and a lot of our middle and high school students are getting emails and notifications through their Blackboard or Canvas systems, it's coming at them in different ways. If it's possible to sit with that with your child one day a week to kind of organize it at one time, that's really helpful. So my suggestion would be, and what we've been doing here is we sit down on a Sunday and we do it child by child and we look at what's coming ahead for the week. We put it on their schedules and then we put it on our calendar as well. And this is something we do with our child because we want them to learn to do it themselves so that they can develop that skill and become independent because we don't want to do this for them for the rest of their lives. So what a great opportunity to take all these different things and make sense of it. So sitting down and being very deliberate about organizing it by subject. And then what I would suggest, again, if it's possible to just focus on one primary subject a day, that seems to be really helpful when we have all these different um, you know, alerts and notifications and systems coming at us to stay focused on the content. If you do have to toggle between the content, my suggestion there would be to make sure that, especially on the screen, that only one subject is open at a time and to turn off all the other notifications. So there's not alerts coming for email. There's not alerts coming from the Blackboard or Canvas site. So the only thing that's on the screen with the volume down is the task that the child is required to do. And then once that's done, in completion, close it out, then open up the next task. And that will reduce some of those distractions as well from the computer. One of our last questions is multiple young kids, multiple curriculums, remote work, and pandemonium all together. Um, so how do you set up young elementary age children to do independent work apart from screens, um, kids getting involved and one kid being jealous of what another kid is watching, so they're distracted trying to help. Any suggestions on that, Christina? I try to get my preschooler involved with my kindergartner or vice versa. Um, I do find it hard to have everything be individualized. So there are times when I can create something that's a little bit easier uh, that my kindergartner's doing for the preschooler. So if we're doing writing, maybe I am just doing a letter saying, oh, okay, well, can you tell me what letter that starts with? While my kindergartner is actually writing sentences or they're having discussions back and forth. Or if we're trying to work with the preschooler, I actually let my kindergartner try to be the teacher a little bit so that they're engaged in each other's learning. And that way we're all doing it together and I'm really not having any of the jealousy issues because they're really doing the same things and then they're working together, they're collaborating and communicating. Um, other things would be, you know, getting them involved in what we kind of talked about before, what interests them. So if you really need one of them to be doing something specific, maybe the other one is doing research into something that they want to do, or they're doing something that's not screen related. They are putting together a little game of their own. Um, I know we created a, a baseball game because my, my kindergartner is really into baseball. So I let him go play that, which is all paper, while I might work with my preschooler. Um, so it's kind of being able to realize that it's not going to be perfect, but try to work in a way that works for your family. And if that's together, just different versions, that could be something or just making something that's really interesting that they're engaged in at that time. So there is no jealousy. Um, thank you. Well, I just wanted to ask, do you have any final thoughts or advice for our families? Um, I would just say to 
be flexible. Um, I realize that there's no one right answer with this, that we're all in uncharted territory. Um, to give yourselves grace as parents, to give yourself the opportunity to make mistakes and know that every day isn't going to be a great one. Um, and again, you know, our kids are, are just as confused as we are and probably just as frustrated. So just remembering that, um, you know, their behaviors are probably a result of their frustration and uncertainty as well. So being flexible, I think, is key. And every day is not going to be perfect. You're going to have a day where you're going to start doing something and it's just going to implode. Walk away. Don't force learning because in the end, they're going to remember what the fun was. They're going to remember the happiness. They, you don't want this to be screaming and frustration for everybody. If it is not working that day, find something else to do. In the end, it's about meeting their needs um, as a human before it is teaching the curriculum. So focus on your child and then the learning will happen. You don't have to be perfect every day and that's okay. And building off of that, what I was going to add is that learning looks a lot of different ways in a lot of different contexts. So even if you feel like you're not teaching at home, your kids are still learning and they're learning really important lessons about how do we take a very difficult situation and how do we make the most of it? How do we check on our neighbors? How do we make sure that everyone's okay? There are elements beyond the curriculum that are going to have lasting impacts on our students' lives. So just trust that you are making a difference and your kids are going to be okay. And keep lines of communication open. Um, that means communicating your struggles and your successes with your different classroom teachers, with other parents in the classroom, with your family members, with your friends, um, sometimes talking it through with somebody or just talking with other people. And that goes for our kids too. Give them those opportunities, hopefully, that they can connect with people in their lives that are important to them. We thank you for viewing this special pre-recorded Mary Wash talk. We hope that we have offered you some insight and some support during this time. Thank you.